my name is Manuela from WSA and I would like to welcome you to this exciting discussion on urban mobility. Please do not forget to ask our panelists through the chat. Um, it is now my pleasure to hand over to our fantastic moderator for this session, Mr. Marco Javonik, CEO of Voyago, that focuses on digital transportation and travel. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Manuela. It's a pleasure to be here today and discuss the innovation in the very exciting urban mobility space. So I would like to briefly present a little bit uh, myself, my team, in what we are doing uh, in this space, and then I will leave the word to the six panelists that are joining us. So uh, pictures sometimes tell more than words. So this is, this is the core team that I'm leading. So I founded uh, Voyego Innovation Lab six years ago. Today it's a little bit bigger team than this. It's about 25 people. We are all very, very passionate on the future of mobility. We are looking primarily about what the digitalization can bring to the mobility. And here, if we fast forward to like 20 years from now, to our vision of mobility, we believe the uh, future mobility will be user-centric, and we believe it will be properly digitalized. And this essentially mean, means that we start integrating various mobility modes into a seamless on-demand available service. This paradigm is referred to as mobility as a service. And it has various maturity levels and, and um, it will have quite a journey, as I said. We see it more as a thing that will happen across two decades than something that will happen next year. Uh, the ultimate vision essentially is will lead us towards unbundling the privately owned car. So if we look at our mobility today, a uh, privately owned car plays a tremendous role. It's a great innovation happened 100 years ago. But times have changed. We, we have a few new enablers that are uh, bringing us better possibilities. And we believe that unbundling this single vehicle that we are using today for all sorts of mobility needs, we believe that this is the better approach to mobility. And I believe uh, the panelists uh, will let you know that there's a lot more vehicles available than the ones that, that I'm sharing on these slides, especially what's missing is the air, which is, which is the third dimension that, that is not utilized the way it could be, let's say, for urban mobility. Um, I would like to make uh, two more small points. So one is that when we are thinking about how to change the world, we should not forget to clean our own bed. Uh, so I'm very happy that a year ago I switched from 25 years of having my own car and now I actually leave this vision of uh, mobility as a service. So a life where I don't own my car, but I have hundreds of vehicles available for me and I can see that this costs me less and especially important, I, I consume much, much less CO2 for my mobility. And the final word is uh, nobody can do it alone. So we recognize this very early. We are very active partners in Mass Alliance as well as many other organizations. And I would definitely recommend uh, collaboration as a key model in how to come to the future of mobility. So that's, that's it from my side as an introduction. Uh, and now I would like to introduce uh, the first panel panelist that will um, basically continue. And this is Mr. Andreas Perotti, Director of Marketing and Communication at FACC AG uh, from Austria. So Andreas, please share introductional thoughts uh, from your side. Thank you so much, Marco, and uh, hello everybody from, from my side, um, dear European Young Innovators Festival, dear colleague, it's my big pleasure to be here, unfortunately not physically, but we're all used to that um, already, so please let me share my screen and I hope you can see the presentation right now. Uh, you know, guys, mobility is becoming an, an ever-increasing need, um, not just in the last years, but it will become more and more and more in the 21st century. And we see it in so many areas, be it from uh, uh, social aspects, um, 
how, how we live our lives, how we have um, job, job, job life uh, balance, uh, working flexibility, but also touching technical means like uh, look at smartphones. I mean, they are nothing less than than a, a form of this um, increasing need for mobility. And of course, it's also touching the question how we get from A to B. And if we look at the mega cities in this world, and you see a picture here of Manhattan, um, we can clearly see that this individual form of mobility, and I'm not speaking about mass transportation right now, um, is getting more and more difficult to fulfill. I mean, having an average speed of eight kilometers per hour is not any longer very satisfying. And if we look up in the sky, we have plenty of space we don't use today for our individual means of transport. And in the aerospace industry, we are investing a lot of time uh, and, 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 and budgets uh, to, to tackle these questions on, on how we can make this space available um, for everybody. And uh, we are partnering with a company which was the first company worldwide which presented a fully autonomous passenger drone 2016 at the Consumer Electronics Show in uh, Las Vegas. Here you see some of the pictures of the, the press coverings back then and throughout the years. And this is uh, the first serial um, passenger model of an autonomous flying uh, drone, what you see here on the screen. Um, it's called the Ehang uh, 216 for two people with 16 rotors. Um, it uh, uh, has fully redundant systems with 16 rotors, 16 electrical engines being uh, um, with zero CO2 emissions, um, fully electric. Um, up to four uh, of these rotors can can uh, stop working and it's still flying. Um, it's a very decent uh, um, piece of hardware. As mentioned, it can carry two people with a total payload of around 250 kilograms. Um, it has a flight duration of uh, around 30 uh, minutes and therefore can bring you um, around 35 kilometers of distance as of today. And the model has reached serial stage, meaning it's already in use at certain areas in the world, mainly um, in uh, the Asian markets. As in the Western world, we are dealing with the regulatory aspects right now. And um, here you see some, some videos of the product flying uh, in urban areas um, in China, for example, where um, a few dozens of these products are in uh, um, commercial use case and are transporting people from A to B. And at the end of the day, it um, not just brings a lot of fun by, by this form of transport, but it brings you the most important currency in our times, which is time. Time you don't spend any longer in traffic jams, uh, time you spend any, don't spend any longer commuting, but uh, uh, time which you can spend for more important things. The two companies behind is on the one end FACC. We are um, an aerospace technology company active since 30 years um, and listed on the Viennese Stock Exchange. We are basically on every aircraft worldwide uh, with our solutions. We're working with Boeing, Airbus, Embraer and everybody else in the industry and we're proud of that. And uh, uh, we're taking care of the hardware while um, our strategic partner Ehang, one of the most promising Asian startups, um, Nasdaq listed already, the first UAM company globally which did an IPO. Uh, they are coming from the software side and they are covering everything about the autonomous uh, flying software. And this makes it uh, um, a real rocket science, um, what we all can benefit from. It's not just touching uh, purely the, the question how we can transport people from A to B, um, but also the cargo and the logistics area. Here you can see a bunch of, of products uh, we are involved in and we are providing for the urban uh, air markets. Uh, the topic of, of Making the airspace available for everybody is not something new and uh, the innovation lies not in the question how we transport people from A to B. We have it since decades and it's called helicopter. Um, while looking on the screen you see a cover from the 1950s on the left um, versus a cover from the late 2000s on the right both showing basically the same dream uh, we're having since decades um, um, and, and, and some call it the flying cars. Um, even though uh, we are still not there yet, we are still in the level of passenger drones. Um, nevertheless, um, as I mentioned, the, the innovation is not in bringing people from A to B, but in making the functional principle of a helicopter affordable for everybody by using technology. And we are very excited to be at the forefront of this topic um, and work with a lot of uh, amazing partners um, to make uh, these products available globally. Thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. 
Uh, thank you, Andreas. This is truly exciting. Uh, I had the pleasure actually to be in Guangzhou at the Ehang uh, premises and, and observed how grocery was delivered uh, with Ehang helicopters and or drones. And I, I'm really looking forward to see this uh, happening also in, in Europe. Um, so the next panelist uh, is Matteo Conzoni uh, from EIT uh, Urban Mobility Italy. Pleasure to have you with us. Uh, can you please introduce a little bit yourself and, and your topic? Yes. So, well, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel on mobility. Again, my name is Matteo Consoni. I work for uh, EIT Urban Mobility. I'm Italian originally, as you said, at the moment I'm based in Barcelona. I work for uh, our Innovation Hub South uh, office, which covers uh, most of the Med Mediterranean countries. I'm going to introduce you just briefly who we are and what we do. As uh, a previous panelists uh, already touched, uh, it's clear that uh, today's model for uh, uh, urban mobility is not sustainable and it requires uh, some uh, immediate uh, changes. Uh, as you can see in the slides, you know, here we have like some very interesting and clear metrics. 23% uh, of uh, Europe uh, greenhouse gases emissions are produced by transport. 50% uh, of public spaces is uh, taken up by roads. 67% uh, uh, of road accidents happen in cities. One year of our lives uh, are spent commuting. This is very interesting to me. And uh, over 130 billion of euro per year are uh, lost due to congestions. The um, EU response to all of these, it's called EIT Urban Mobility. We are the Urban Mobility Knowledge and Innovation Community of EIT, which in case you don't know, it is the European Institute of Innovation and Technology, the body of uh, the European Union funded by the European Commission back in 2008 to support uh, Europe uh, being more innovative, basically. And we are one of the um, youngest of these knowledge and innovation communities. Uh, we started in 2019, and actually this one, the 2020 is our first operational year, a uh, year full of uh, challenges, as you can imagine, but also a lot of opportunities. Our uh, mission is to create more livable urban spaces, and we basically aim to become the biggest um, European initiative working on urban mobility. We have a mandate from uh, the EU and a budget of uh, 400 million uh, to invest uh, in innovation by 2026. In order to do this, we bring together partners from different areas, cities especially, because we want to accelerate the innovation process that is started by European cities, research and technologies organization, universities, and uh, uh, of course also industry partners. We are working on different pillars. Uh, again, at the core of our activities, uh, there, is, there are our cities. Uh, with whom we run uh, internal innovation projects, uh, we run business creation activities uh, to support and invest in startups uh, and educational activities like uh, research programs, uh, hackathons, uh, master schools, PhDs, and so on. So many, many things. Uh, in all this frame, I personally focus on uh, startup support. I'm responsible for the support and investments uh, that um, we run and implementing startups in uh, the south of Europe. So I'm, I'm very happy and I look forward to, to this panel. I'm responsible for the support and investment. I, I hear an echo. We run and implementing startups in uh, the south of Europe. So okay, now. Um, well, again, all of this, everything we do is basically to increase the, the quality of life of uh, European citizens by, by creating more livable urban spaces. I'm really looking forward to the panel, and uh, thanks again for uh, this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Matteo, for your introduction. Very exciting topic. Glad to hear that the European Commission is recognizing the importance to accelerate innovation. And I'm sure we'll have some questions about uh, how to use this funding in the best way. Uh, next with us is Helena uh, Guggenbichler from Doppler Austria. Helena, please, the floor is yours to present your Thanks initiative. Thanks a lot, Marco. And as I just read that some people have issues uh, with the screen, so I will keep myself to audio only and um, hope to get the message across. 
Uh, so actually, Doppler Gruppe doesn't sound like very um, interesting or very known to a lot of people here, so I'm sure to explain what I'm doing. I'm the CEO, CEO of the Shared Services for this group. And this group actually is a family enterprise existing since 1920, and it started with gas stations. So the Austrians amongst you for sure know the Turm oil gas station, so we are really old school. That's where we're coming from. Mineral oils, gas stations, automotive, old school, classic. And the most really exciting part about this company, and that's why I was actually joining and the most exciting, one of the most exciting jobs in my life, is that this is a company which really knows, okay, we will have to transform from the classic third generation gas stations to the future. So what are we doing, did we do, and are we going to do in the future? So uh, Doppler Gruppes or Tumor was one amongst the first to start as well gas stations really with natural gas and we are currently as well transforming from the natural petroleum gas to biogas so we really to get into clean energy and six years ago it obviously went very strongly into the e-mobility so with the first uh, e-chargers etc and we get into the clean e-mobility production and infrastructure for e-mobile cards. But what for me the real interesting part is, and for my company in the future, is we are really good in infrastructure. We know what people, where people charge, what people charge and what people need in an infrastructure since 1920. And we see how this is evolving and how this will change now with new energies, getting into clean energies, but as well into more needs or into very different needs compared to what has been in the past. I really liked in the introduction that we are talking here about more flexibility. It's much more about more collaboration. So you see it's not only people have a car or to have public transport or the scooter. We yet see now with this mix between e-mobility and gas station, which we still have, people come to our gas stations with the e-card, with the e charge it there, and in between they use the scooter. Or people come with the bikes to check with the pneus, the same as they do with the cars. So there's much more like, it's much more like a puzzle. And the second part, mobility is about transportation. So I really like the introduction of Andreas Perotti, because what we see as well with infrastructure is that it's a lot about, and now in the lockdowns even more, of course, is about, hey, um, services which we do with postal services. How do you transport things or send things away? So I think here comes the connections, which what I like to see about the drones. Yeah, the one thing about mobility is I move myself. The other thing is I move other things. So I might get to an infrastructure, say, yeah, here I come with my scooter, but I need to get something which I would like to put on a drone and send somewhere. So for me, it's really interesting. And here I see it firsthand in full transformation in this company from classic mobility is I need to get myself from A to B to I go from A to B to Z to seven with eight different ways of moving, plus I need to transport something else, which might be a person or which might be a package. And that's really what we see on our, yes, they call it gas station, even if they now have photovoltaic part and, and e-mobility, but we really see this coming together and it's extremely exciting. Thank you very much, uh, Helena, for your introduction. Pleasure to have you with us also to, to explain a little bit how the traditional players are really uh, thinking about joining this mobility revolution. So thank you for your um, uh, initial words. The next one with us is Esan uh, Zadmart. So he's CEO of Alveri GmbH from Austria. Esan, uh, please introduce yourself and your company. Thank you very much. Um, I just start sharing my screen. I hope you see it. Um, yeah, we are from Alveri. Um, we we started and, and founded our company last year, so a very young startup um, in the beautiful city of Riedemünkreis in Upper Austria. 
and we we just have the aim to look at the trends and to look um, how we can use these trends um, to to make it more user friendly. So we we all know the trends and we will hear it a lot uh, today. It's it's about electrif uh, electrification, about uh, connected services, about uh, sharing, about intelligence and autonomous driving, and of course all this uh, stuff is is very fast uh, changing in in the market. So we started with the electrification and wait uh, the the experience that is very difficult for people nowadays to, to change to um, cars which are electrified and with uh, electrified uh, power units. So we started to found or, or to release um, an app um, which is an intelligent platform for for people who want to change from combustion engine to an electric uh, car one. Um, we gave them a little bit of intelligence, which is called the Alveri TBS. It's a tracking-based selling system, so you can uh, track your daily routes, and our system will tell you which car fits the best to you, which is electrified at the moment, and you can directly um, go through the app and and uh, search your your dealer um, of choice and and give him the uh, the, the information that you want to to buy um, electrified car. Of course, uh, this is just one part of, of our of our company. We are also dealing with infrastructure, uh, payment systems, car concept. Also, how can it look in the future? Which uh, tools we do do we need in the future? And uh, what what is very important um, also for us is the offline. Um, we are calling it home of mobility. How does the offline system of future mobility look like? Where can people go and get the information of, of future mobility? Or can uh, look at uh, different uh, varieties of vehicles, um, cars, drones, and so on. We already work with, uh, with some partners, with some universities, also in different, um, in different uh, products and, and also for um, different projects. So this was a really short introduction about um, about our project. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Isan. Glad to have you with 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 us uh, to represent this really young uh, one year old startup. Um, next one with us is Hans Kinski. Uh, he's CEO of Cyclotech from Austria. Hans, uh, please introduce your topic. We, we cannot hear you, Hans. First technical mistake. Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, all the panel uh, discussion participants and everybody at home. Um, short introduction of ourselves. I'm uh, Nanski Akinski, CEO of Cyclotech. Um, in contrary to um, ESAN, we have not found it last year, but we call ourselves the um, oldest startup um, in Austria, founded about 16 years ago. And what are we doing is um, we are trying to um, uh, be part of the future of the vertical mobility. So we are not reinventing the wheel, but we try to, let's say, have a radical new approach. So we're taking an old technology, which is coming from um, the um, um, the maritime um, 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 field and try to turn it into the most agile and most precise um, EV trail propulsion technology. Um, so how does the principle itself work? So it's more or less you have a rotor with several blades which are connected to a, um, a central hub. The rotor itself is um, rotating around the, the central axis. Um, and if you move um, the eccentric, um, 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 the, the hub in an eccentric position, then you um, accelerate the airflow through the rotor. And within fractions of a second, you can steer the direction of the airflow um, 360 degrees around the central axis. So it gives you an agile and precise uh, possibility to have everything um, 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 steered within a short time. Um, the technology itself um, um, is usable for VTOL, and as Andreas already said, in the past there has already only been, let's say, helicopters available. So what we try is to um, have a new way also on looking on conventional um, systems to enhance them. So you can combine our product um, with conventional um, technologies, but you can use it also for um, drones, you can use it for air, and air mobility, air taxis. So the, um, um, there are a lot of possibilities. 
Um, where's our current status? Um, we are currently building our technology prototype, which is a approximately 80 kilogram um, um, flight demonstrator. Um, so it's fully assembled already. We are in system tests and hope to get it um, flying by the end um, of this year, hopefully before Christmas. So um, that's, I think, one of the uh, interesting um, 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 projects within the aviation industry and yeah, be proud to be part of it. Uh, thank you very much, Hans. And and we go to our uh, last but not least, uh, the, the panelist of Holger uh, Frimelt. So he's head of Institute of Aviation at uh, FH uh, Johannemum in Graz. So please, uh, Holger, the floor is yours. So welcome everybody. Um, last but not least, um, I have now have the chance to reflect a little bit of what uh, the previous speakers have said. Um, of course, my main focus is on teaching, but we also do a lot of research in, in terms of novel um, mobility, of course, with a focus on aerial mobility. Um, so Andreas Perotti's uh, introductory note um, is quite welcome here and I can build on that. Um, but I would like to raise um, the, the more general questions here. We have heard a lot of technical details from Hans, from Andreas. Uh, we have heard a little bit of technical details on infrastructure from Helena and from ESAN now. Um, but uh, we need to be honest with such a new disruptive technology like drones, but I think it can be generalized to any new kind of mobility concepts. Sorry for the typo there. And ask ourselves, are the business cases really ready? Um, are our applications green enough or are we just moving uh, from one dirty uh, way of transportation to another um, not so environmentally friendly way of transportation? Um, are our novel concepts well inter integrated into our ecosystem? Um, with drones it's very um, challenging because we have other airplanes in the air and we don't want to crash in into them but on the ground of course we have similar um, topics and challenges. And last but not least, um, in order to be successful, we need to um, reflect whether the general public understands what we offer them, what is it beneficial to them, do, do they like it, do they accept it, or are they hesitant to use an air taxi, or are they hesitant to do car sharing in uh, times of, a pen, uh, of corona, those kind of things. <clears throat> or in other words, summarizing this, it's not only the focus on the technical system, uh, which is here on the left hand side as an unmanned aerial system, but could also be any other kind. Um, we need to understand the aspects of validation and verification. How do we make sure, sure it meshes with the existing systems, uh, can support a transition phase or a blend in phase? Is it safe enough? Does it meet our standards? We need to understand the social impact. And last but not least, it's not only the uh, individual component, but it's the overall working together of the, um, for example, the um, EHANG um, system with the landing sites, uh, with the, um, um, the um, digital um, support. How can you order such a air taxi or such a means of transportation? So it's also a lot about infrastructure needs. Um, and now here a little bit of, of the bad news and good news at the same time, looking at the Gartner technology cycle, and I'm sure you're all familiar with that. We see that uh, commercial drone applications or novel um, um, sustainable means of transportation, you also see autonomous vehicles, um, so electrical drive, um, cars um, and so on. They are a little bit past the technology uh, hype um, they're going through the valley of tears and we have a lot of work or some work uh, to do to, uh, to go through this um, valley or this dip uh, to, uh, to be uh, um, successful in the end. And to be successful in the end means that there is a plenty of opportunities for all you young innovators to, to bring in your ideas whether it's still making technology better or safer, but also bringing your um, innovative ideas uh, with respect to interfacing, um, controlling, using, um, social acceptance, promoting, um, 
all those things that we get to, uh, quickly through this um, startup phase with innovators, it has you, um, early adopters, and then into a big, big market for our products. Or in other words, this technology and excuse myself or sorry for choosing a, an airplane here it could be anything um, we need to do um, our internal quality control we need to link our offering our technology product offering to the overall um, environment and we need to communicate about what we are doing um, since i'm coming from a university uh, we should not neglect um, education we need the right mindset of young people, of students or graduates that um, have that broad thinking. It's not only about a particular discipline, but we need to be broad enough so that we understand all the key elements that can contribute to an innovative, novel um, urban mobility concept. And, and we at FIU Arneum in Cards, we do this quite successful, uh, shown here by the industry uh, magazine rating from last year. So thank you very much. And I hand back over to. Thank you very much, uh, Holger. Um, so uh, happy to see uh, uh, such a diverse group of, of uh, people basically discussing a very important topic. Um, so before I start with the first round of, of questions, I would just like to invite also the audience to participate with the questions, you know, so uh, I'm hopeful that this is as interactive as possible. So please do post your questions uh, so that I can ask the panelists. Um, so now to start off. I mean, just just by looking at the panelists, we can see, you know, where we we have startups, we have traditional companies, we have, uh, you know, faculty, we have uh, European Commission, and so forth. Uh, one of my learnings is uh, mobility is one of the most multi-dimensional problems that that, that 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 we can face, you know. Um, and and so there are many many challenges, but also many opportunities at the same time. And I would like maybe in the first round a little bit to explore this from your different points of view. And maybe uh, Andreas, if we start with you, with you, so how do you see the big challenges from your point of view of the drone business? And then what are the big enablers as well as really the big opportunities that you see ahead? Maybe short term as well as uh, long term. Yes, thank you so much for the question. Well, I think basically um, we have to be very clear that um, a lot of the public discussion is has in focus replacement. One, one mean of transport replacing another one and the car versus the bicycle, uh, the aircraft uh, against the plane, uh, the, the passenger drone against the car. Um, and, and I think this is totally the wrong approach. I think every mean of transport has its rights for existence. Also, passenger drones or cargo drones will not replace something. I mean, um, maybe in a few hundred years we experience a scenario where, where we purely are up in the air, but this will not be the case in the close future. Um, while it's more about providing added value. It's about adding something. Um, and at the end of the day, this also comes along with a total change of mindset, especially of young people. I mean, thinking back 30 years, it was a kind of status symbol to own a car. Uh, you wanted to have a car. It was not 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 so much about getting from A to B, but having having the 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 vehicle as a status symbol. And uh, I think this this totally uh, uh, changed. It's not any longer the question with what mean of transport you gave from A to B, but how you get from A to B. And you want it convenient, you want it uh, uh, sustainable, and you want it uh, uh, efficient. And 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 here is where where urban air comes in. Um, we we see a lot of use cases where these technology can provide added value, um, but of course not for every use case. And, and also in the future, there will remain use cases where it's the best uh, to keep on walking as we did the last thousands of years. Yeah? Um, of course, this change um, will, will, will take a lot of time. And I think the big difference in urban air and in autonomous uh, uh, um, aircraft, uh, when you compare it to autonomous driving on the ground, is the ecosystem. Um, in autonomous driving, it's about implementing a new technology in an ecosystem which has been steadily growing over decades, while urban air is about creating a whole new ecosystem where the vehicle plays a very important role, but it's only one pillar out of many. Um, 
And thinking back 100 years ago when cars have been invented, uh, we are at a similar stage now uh, with, with urban air. So at the very beginning, but it got seriously started. It's not any longer science fiction. It's not a matter of one year, but it's also not a matter of 30 years. It will come throughout the next decade. And if you would have told 100 years ago somebody uh, that millions of millions of cars are driving around, that uh, uh, billions of square meters are covered with concrete and, and, and it stinks and it pollutes the world, everybody would have said we better stick with the horse. Yeah? And I think it's always the same with, with huge changes are um, ahead of us and we definitely have a very huge change in mobility uh, uh, in front of, of, of mankind. And uh, it's fantastic what, what, what this will benefit um, to our daily lives. Thank you, Andreas. Some really uh, wise words that resonate also with me and my approach. Uh, in particular, I like this, you know, uh, change of mindset and and you know, asking young people many times for for where we should go. And Matteo, I believe you are kind of um, in the role of um, also empowering these um, young people uh, in going into innovation in um, urban mobility space. So how do you see uh, the challenges, opportunities from your point of view? And how, how can we boost this young mindset uh, and invite them to innovate even more aggressively in this space? Well, that's a good question. First of all, uh, I want to underline that I very much agree with what you said, that uh, mobility is a very multidisciplinary field touching on many different verticals like uh, health, uh, manufacturing, climate, energy, just to mention some. Uh, I would say that we can summarize the challenges that uh, mobility is facing into four, well, in many different ways, but in my mind, I summarize them in four main areas. Uh, mobility today or up until today uh, has proven to be very inefficient, very congested, somehow disconnected, and definitely not eco-friendly. All these challenges have been uh, um, hyped or, let's say, brought to another level with the, with the COVID now, right? Because, uh, well, we came up with a very, very new scenario where there are, like, uh, many different needs, uh, a need for safety, for cleaning, for social distancing. Um, it, it changed the, the way that... Um, People want to travel by choosing many more, uh, like more, uh, um, let's say, private way of transportation. We saw many cities around Europe reacting to this, implementing like uh, from one day to the other, uh, bike lanes, uh, pedestrian lanes, like changing the way that the pedestrian lanes were organized. And of course, uh, uh, all these are like big challenges but as all the challenges, they open up also very interesting opportunity for the different actors. So since you asked me about startups, I think, uh, I think that the, the opportunity for startups is, is really to, to innovate you know, and to be the driver of innovation because cities can accelerate the process of innovation and they can be a bit the, the testbed where to test in real life environment and new technologies that then can be scaled. The, the industry, like if we take, for example, uh, car manufacturing and so on, I think that they have a mandate to, to drive innovation and not to resist. You know, if we take the example for, a, like, uh, just as an example, again, like car manufacturing, uh, you know, we saw like a big decrease of the number of people getting driving license in the past uh, decades. Uh, and this is changing the concept of uh, ownership of cars and the business model of the car industry, you know. So now, like, big car manufacturing uh, companies, you know, they, they, they have, like, two ways to react to this, you know. Either, uh, either they try to resist or they just adapt and drive change, you know. And in all these scenarios, startups, uh, can, can definitely play a huge role. And I think that the key to make this work for the final benefit of uh, citizens and users and us, basically, is to try to, to bring this actor together and allow them to collaborate with each other, no? instead of competing or, or trying to prevail one on the other. Uh, I hope I answered a bit your question. 
Yeah, very, 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 very good. Uh, thank you for your answer. And also thank you uh, for, for um, talking a little bit also about COVID-19. I don't want to put too much attention to that, but we have to acknowledge, um, you know, moving movement of people is at the center of this uh, pandemic, you know. Yeah. So we just need to mention this, you know, and of course it has impact on startups as well as on, on, on mature companies. Um, now, uh, Helena, for you, I have a question. So. I talk with, you know, thousands of companies, startups, traditional uh, companies, you know, and of course, startups, they have so many ideas, you know, but then they don't have money, they cannot, they, they cannot execute, you know, and, and many uh, these young innovators and startups, they are dreaming, wow, in these traditional companies, they have so big budgets and so forth. But uh, I know very well that also it's not rosy. So you also have your own challenges and opportunities. Can you walk us a little bit into your world and how you see, uh, you know, future of urban mobility from a point of a company which I believe you said 80 years old or something like this. So <laughs> even even I think even 100. So yeah, um, for us actually it's. Oh yeah, I like the company. It's amazing. So what I like a lot, I think I, I really like a lot what Andreas has said. What we see is much more, the world becomes much and more complementary. So for us, it's amazing because from an infrastructure perspective, as well as what startups doing, what from the science, what it comes, it's kind of you are in front of a buffet and you are not sure, hey, what to pick because there are so many points where you could complement each other, interact, use our infrastructure to develop into something new to just complete the part. So that's amazing. And I as well see there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of know-how on how to do, how to, for example, connect the airspace, connect the, yeah, as well really the, the classical bicycle pedestrian space into it. So this is amazing. And that's a time where you see so many opportunities that you could, yeah, you could, uh, you would love to pick 20 of them or 200 of them. The real challenge, and I think that's as well the challenge for all the startups is, at the point where we are now, and suppose this was the same when people decided between let's go into the steampunk area or let's go into, at that point in time, oil, <laughs> um, you still don't know which business model will be the sustainable one, which will be the one which is surviving after you just just get the subsidiaries from the government because for a company like ours, which is a family company which wants to last for the six, next sixth generation, it's something which needs to last after you do not get the subsidiaries from government anymore. So of course now, really interesting, which is the one which will last? And the other part, and because that's one which we would like to pick. And the other part, a really interesting part is as well, it of course what you charge, so from point of business model view, what you charge the customer for is completely changing. I mean, the old world, doesn't matter if it's mobility or anything, it's kind of people pay for the product. It's oil or it's as a food or anything. Now it changes to something to people pay for time. So, you know, the base of what you charge and what at the end you paid your employees from is really changing and that's extremely interesting. So that's, a, but of course it's as well the challenge because you need to change the mindset, you need to change the interaction, you need to change your data models, you need to change your billing models. So really exciting times. Yeah, thank, thank you for your, for your comments. Uh, again, it fully resonates with me. So uh, I'm heading uh, business model uh, and governance work group in Mass Alliance. And I have to say, this is exactly the key challenge that we're dealing with, you know. So what is the business model? And the answer is we really don't know. And, and some of our thinking is that we will need a lot of innovation labs focused specifically on business models because, because too many are focused on technology, but actually the real issue is what is the, the future business model? And, and we believe it will be much more dynamic and there will be many more business models than, than in the past where the situation was simple. So going forward uh, to Esan, so um, a story of a young um, innovation company, I, I'm always inspired by you know what what makes you go for this uh, bold bold uh, steps you know to start uh, own company and and uh, you know try to make it in this tough 
<laughs> business world. Can you share a little bit uh, from your side, just the story, how you got to that, and also where you see uh, the challenges as well as opportunities? Yeah, of course. Um, the story is very easy because uh, I just um, experienced it by, by myself. Uh, it's like um, a friend of mine wanted to, to buy an electric vehicle um, and, and want to drive a CO2 neutral. And, and he didn't do that because he said it's a little bit too complicated to have the whole infrastructure, to have the right cards, to, to get the, the battery charged and everything. Uh, and I thought to myself, it can't be in the 21st century that we are ready to buy um, an electric car but we don't do that because it's too complicated. So for us, an important thing and, and uh, the main reason why we started is to set the consumer and the user um, in the middle of everything we're doing. And uh, I really hope that you don't ask me because of the business model, because our business model changed in the last uh, 16 months, I think three times, because you have to adapt it on the, you have to adapt it on the, on the market. And this market is changing very, very fast. And, and Helena sa said it right. It's the people are, are paying for services more now than for, for goods. So we, um, we provide the people a service with our app, with our Elvery app, that um, the pandemic, we just, just go through it, um, forced uh, the people stay at home. And now they can, um, they can look at the cars without going to the dealer because it's not possible yet, uh, but still have the opportunity. So it, it gives us a little bit of a boost um, that, that also in this old field of area in, in, with the dealership uh, of, of cars, that there is still space for, for young innovative companies. Great, uh, thank you for your uh, input as well. Um, so Hans, maybe uh, from your side, so um, as a, let's say, young initiative in the aviation space, so how do you see this? And especially, I'm, I'm wondering, so, I mean, it will take, it will take uh, many, many years for this really to pick up, you know? So how do you, uh, how, how do you manage to kind of sustain your business over this period? You know, how do you work with the financing, uh, business development of, of these kind of initiatives? If you can share a little bit your thoughts on that. Yeah, that is, um, as Holger said, we are in the, sometimes or a lot of times in the Valley of Tears, uh, as a lot of other startups as well, and it's always, difficult, let's say, to, to get engaged with the old industry that might have the money to change, but they often have, let's say, they're not as flexible, not as fast as uh, smaller companies or smaller organizations are. So um, we always, let's say, go half year by half year. We can get grants from the Austrian state, we get uh, money from uh, private investors, um, and we try to, let's say, build up corporations with larger um, um, aviation companies, as they will have the money they are used to spend millions in technology development, because that's their daily business, but bringing in new ideas for new concepts. Um, but as you said, it's, it's tricky to um, um, sustain and, and try to stay on the market, but we think um, as so many business models change, there might or there should also be an additional segment for our technology because there are so many different use cases in, in urban air mobility that for sure there will be a segment and there will be a market where our technology will bring some benefits um, uh, and we are convinced that even if there's a long way to go because the certification um, um, is not clear yet, um, even in, in, in drones, it's changing quickly. Um, so that will still, for sure, take uh, two, three years until our technology will come close to market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then, and then, Holger. So you you mentioned you were talking a little bit about this sustainability, and we have our first question uh, actually from the audience. Uh, about ranking the options for future mobility with regards to uh, sustainability development goals. So can you a little bit talk about that? Yes, I can. And um, to, to help that, um, I have uh, pulled up the 17 um, SDGs here. Um, so, uh, Peter, your question is, is quite challenging to come up with a ranking because um, the market and the possibilities are so new, so fresh that we do not yet have um, a clear 
winner and uh, maybe runner up. But the good news is that with um, uh, those disruptive technologies um, like urban air mobility, um, we are addressing a lot of different um, um, aspects and we need to be um, open-minded enough to use um, this technology to, uh, to find business cases in all areas. Um, and let me jump just to a few um, health and well-being. Um, of course, an air taxi can also be a flying ambulance car. Um, so you do not need to wait for the expensive, uh, loud rescue helicopter, but um, maybe um, a flying ambulance air taxi is at your location faster. And also, since it's not burning a kerosene, but since it's run on electric power, uh, it's more sustainable. Um, even the the aspect of education isn't isn't it an an idea that an air taxi could potentially at some point of time bring a teacher to a remote location where students otherwise would not have a teacher, um, like maybe somewhere in Africa or so. So. Um, to all of you um, European uh, creative innovators, think out of the box what we can do. Um, and if we continue through those um, sustainable uh, development goals, um, we'll find a lot, um, a lot of um, applications where, for example, uh, life on land um, with easy, sustainable um, mobility offerings we suddenly do not discriminate people that live in a very rural, very remote area because now they also have um, a method to, to participate in sustainable mobility concepts. Um, maybe not riding the e-bike uh, 30 kilometers to the next city to be able to go to a theater or to a movie um, or um, um, an evening class or something like that, but they, they have a, an air taxi that collects them and brings them to that um, um, that cultural offering. Uh, so Peter, as I said, not a single winner, a lot of different winners here in the Sustainable um, Development Goals uh, matrix. Thank you very much. Um, and, and now I would continue basically with open questions. So whoever feels um, like like uh, wanting to share something, please please go ahead. And, and I would start with um, this collaboration, you know, so so we said nobody can do it alone. And actually, from my work in Mass Alliance and Elsource, I, I see no private company can do it alone and no public organization can do it alone. And, and, and so the question is, how do we get the right collaboration? Who takes the lead? How do we engage? What is the good model? So does anybody have some good practices, best practices to share or some advice in terms of how to achieve uh, this collaboration in a very good way. So who, who wants to take on this uh, uh, challenge? Let, let me start. Um, since we have so many disciplines, um, the, the road to success is, is working to, together. And since we have um, a lot of small players or still small players since it's startups, uh, young companies uh, or companies working in this niche markets of urban mobility, urban air mobility and other forms of mobility. There is this inherent need to work together um, and we, do, we shall not be afraid of working together because we're not taking away uh, different things. So if we just look at this panel here, I think we, we all come from different areas and I would, would be more than happy to work with all and any of you. And you're not a competitor to me. And I think, uh, or I hope you all agree that um, if we would form a bigger company or um, it doesn't need to be a company, a corporation uh, um, or a team, an integrated team, then we could um, uh, really be successful. And out to the, um, the innovators in the audience, um, don't be afraid to look for partners in areas where you do not have the expertise and where you maybe also don't need that expertise because it's only a short period in your development cycle where you need uh, maybe a icing um, wind tunnel, uh, icing wind tunnel, or you need a payment system, or you need a data link, or you need a social acceptance study. Um, that's my first pitch to that question, Marco. 
Yeah, it's, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other uh, thoughts on this? Yes, if you allow me to jump in here, and I uh, cannot agree more with with, with Holga. I think. Um, Especially the topics of uh, the topic of, of urban air mobility demands for a lot of collaboration in between the private industries, but also the public. Um, the FIU and Neon where Hoka is active, and also FSCC together with 23 other partners in Austria, we made a kind of role model here by forming Air Labs Austria. Um, it's a, a non-profit entity where the whole community from science, from industry, uh, came together to to collaborate and and and, and push uh, the topic of uh, uh, um, drone technologies forward and build a kind of harmonized interface um, towards towards also the the, the public. Um, so if you're interested in that, just Google Air Labs Austria. Um, very nice example for that. Generally speaking, um, in every area what is uh, very regulatory intensive, and the airspace is a regulatory intensive environment, there is no way besides collaborating in between private and public partnerships. Um, and at the end of the day, it will also be a question of business models. I mean, um, we talked a lot about business models and that mobility solutions have to be um, also sustainable after public money is ending. The truth is we see a lot of means of transport out there, and I would say 90% of public transport, which would not exist without uh, uh, public funding and which would not exist um, when they would be purely based on a business model, especially in the railway, but, all, but also uh, in cities. And this is something we should consider. And here I think uh, uh, um, urban air um, can contribute a lot, but at the same time, the whole term of urban air is a bit contradicting because it's not only for urban, it's not only for uh, uh, big cities. And frankly speaking, in Europe, there are not that many which are really in need of an urban air system. Um, while in Europe, it's uh, uh, more interesting to see the connection in between urban centralized regions and uh, the countryside. And um, we, we also have a trend right now in our uh, uh, economies, which is a bit of awkward. I mean, people are forced to move into cities uh, because the jobs are accumulated there, because the companies are accumulated there. At the same time, uh, uh, they, they cannot afford life any longer because uh, real estate is getting so expensive. And when they're getting out, they sit in the car for two hours and we discuss about uh, uh, sustainable development goals. And, and, and here I see a huge chance in, 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 in moving up, in finding new means of transport and urban air or passenger drones uh, using the sky has one big asset compared to anything else and compared to every public transport as well. Um, it means and demands for very little infrastructure investment. You don't need rails, you don't need roads, uh, you don't even need a fancy starting or landing uh, ground. And yes, it cannot transport millions of people like an underground or a railway can, but look at the rural areas where you have a train going uh, in the best case where you have five wagons with three people inside maybe every three hours and 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 uh, uh, here i think um, urban air uh, and drone technologies can contribute a lot and 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 and, and improving uh, um, let's say the daily life of people in commuting but also in general quality of life You're still on mute, Marco. Marco you don't hear you. Yeah. Uh, so fully agree. So very important um, piece of the future uh, mobility puzzle, uh, air mobility. And we have a, a specific question also regarding this. So how much of urban air mobility will actually be electrified? So who, who wants to answer this one? Maybe I jump in there <laughs> as we have a um, a technology demonstrator um, trying to take off. Um, the main problem for electric currently still is the, the uh, energy density, um, um, which is far less than um, in, in oil or in gas. Um, I think Helena, um, Andreas or Holger, they will know for sure as well um, that there's a long way to go. I think everything between up to 30 minutes might be available um, um, by electric and further it will be really really difficult there might be some years to go and all the rest first of all will be hybrid from my point of view any other thoughts uh, from the panelists on this i, I know we have uh, several experts on urban air mobility 
let's not be so pessimistic about the future. I think there will be new technologies, new inventions that will also help us fly longer than 30 minutes. New batteries, new configurations, hybrid uh, with uh, fuel cells, many, many ideas. And, and then there are ideas which are, there's ideas on electric, but there are also ideas on biogas. So there's not only one way to do it. Excellent. Fully. I like this optimistic uh, spirit, you know, so I think as we're concluding, I think we should uh, we should uh, conclude in optimistic way. Any, any final words, uh, opti optimistic about the future mobility? Anybody wants to share with us? A question to, to, to you all and the audience, aren't you ready to travel, to move again with all this pandemic? I think uh, being forced not to move that much or not to experience the positives of mobility uh, is really the, the motivation for all of us to work on um, those new concepts uh, so that when we can travel again, uh, we do it in the best way. I think this is a beautiful uh, uh, thought to conclude this. I think uh, many times when you lose something, actually, then you start appreciating. Exactly. And I think it, it exactly resonates with me and many people that I, I, I see. We, we miss going for a coffee with, with our loved ones and so forth so much. And we miss traveling. We miss moving around. So uh, that, that should be exactly motivation for us to keep on the good work. And, and accelerate our, our path towards uh, future and sustainable mobility. So with this, I would like to thank you uh, sincerely for your contributions in the panel. And I would like to uh, give the word to Manuela, uh, who I believe has an announcement to, to be made.